Thank you, choir. That was indeed beautiful. It's a good thing we prayed, didn't it? <laughs> Y'all did a beautiful job. Thank you so much. I'd like to draw our attention to a reading this morning from the book of Psalms. Not many of our scripture lessons come from the book of Psalms, but our lection directs us toward Psalm 137 today. And I want to read it, uh, verses 1 through 6. Psalm 137, verses 1 through 6. By the rivers of Babylon we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. There on the poplars we hung our harps, for there our captors ask us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord in a strange and foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, may my right, right hand forget its skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of of my mouth if I do not remember you, if I do not consider Jerusalem my highest joy. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Bow with me once again for a word of prayer. Oh God, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Judah's national history spans 345 years. I say that knowing that a lot of you in the congregation know Old Testament history and understand Old Testament history much better than I. I always find it difficult because sometimes in the same passage, one person may have two or sometimes even three names. So it's quite difficult as we try to understand the nation of Israel and its history. But we do know, you remember, right after King David, his son Solomon became king. And his extravagant living, it appears, seems to have been one of many issues that divided the nation. And so then we have the nation of Israel becoming Israel to the north and Judah to the south. Samaria in the north was the kingdom. In the south it was indeed Jerusalem. And it was a rocky time. During that 345 years, there were 20 different kings for the southern kingdom of Judah. And as you read about their history, often we will read that he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. That could be said of eight of those 20, which left 12 of those 20 for which we read, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. And it was the prophet Jeremiah speaking to some of those southern kings, five of them in all, who tried his best to lead them toward doing right. But rather they chose the evil way. Jehoiakim was one of them. We can read about it in Jeremiah chapter 36, Jeremiah was told by God to go and write it on a scroll so that it might be delivered and Jehoiakim can read the word of the Lord. But it's interesting if you read the story while it was being read this, you can just imagine in your mind's eye, while it was being read to the king, the king had a sharp knife and he was cutting off paragraph by paragraph. Every time one was read, he would cut it off and throw it into the fire. That's what he thought about it. But in 604 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar marched into Jerusalem. 
I won't bore you with all of the gory details, but I would tell you that his body was thrown over the city wall to decay to the elements, never to have experienced burial. That's exactly what Jeremiah told him would happen. And when he died, his son Jehoiachin became king. And it's according to which uh, uh, record you actually read. He was either 8 or 18 when he became king. Whichever it was, he only served for three months and ten days. Now, by my calculations, that's about a hundred days. And then he, too, was taken off into captivity, into Babylon, with 10,000 of Judah's choice citizens, which, by the way, included the prophets Daniel and Ezekiel. Jeremiah was able to escape being captured. So he was still around when Zedekiah became king. That was Jehoiachin's uncle. He was placed there by Nebuchadnezzar, who was indeed the Babylonian king, to be a vassal servant there. But he had designs with the nation of Egypt thinking that they might be able to come back in and take over. And it was finally uh, uh, defeated by Babylonia. And in December of 589 B.C., the Babylonian soldiers marched into Jerusalem and for 30 months, 30 months they laid waste to the nation of Israel. Excuse me, Judah. Zedekiah watched as they slaughtered his two sons. And then they gouged out his eyes and took him to Babylon. That was the setting in which an unknown musician wrote and led the captives in this psalm that I read for your hearing this morning. By the, Baber, by the rivers of Babylon we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. And I find myself, I know that it might sound silly to some, but some of you would understand. I find myself singing the same song sometimes when I get caught up in, in what is difficult for me individually, what's difficult for St. John's Church, what's difficult for the nation, the United States. How in the world can we sing the Lord's song? in what feels like such a foreign and strange land. But I'm reminded the singer was wrong. It may sound odd. Listen to me for just a moment. It may sound odd that I'm saying that Scripture was wrong. That was indeed what the psalmist was singing. But I would suggest to you that the psalmist was wrong. They were not in a land away from God. Yes, it's true. Socially, politically, religiously, and even literally, their existence had become dust. But God had not forsaken. God was there all the time which is the first thing that I would want to say to you this morning. Please remember, Emmanuel, God with us. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. What is Zion? Zion is unknown derivation of what the word actually means, but we know that it, it stands for the mountain of God. What makes Zion, Zion? God. 
And what makes our existence more, better, is it not the fact that God is with us? In John chapter 1, you all know that John is one of my favorites. We're, we're reading what the way John started his gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Down in verse 14. And the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. And we have seen His glory. The glory of the one and only. The one from the Father, full of grace and truth. If you want to know when it actually happened, read the end of the Gospel of Matthew. You will remember that in Matthew chapter 27, at the very moment that Jesus breathed His last breath, on the cross, that curtain which represented the division between God and humanity, which represented the, the idea that we've got God in a box back behind this curtain. What happened? The ground beneath, began to shake beneath their feet. And that curtain was torn in two. And folks just like you and me, we had full access to God through His Son, Jesus Christ. And no longer was God in a special room. No longer was God in a box. But God was everywhere. I know most of you have heard this little ditty before. Let me just remind you of what one anonymous writer wrote he was just a little boy on the week's first day he was wandering home from Sunday school and dawdling along the way he scuffed his shoes into the grass he found a caterpillar he found a fluffy milkweed pod and blew out all the filler a bird's nest in the tree overhead so wisely placed on high was just another wonder that caught his eager eye. A neighbor watched his zigzag course and called him from the lawn, asked him where he'd been that day and what was going on. I've been to Sunday school, he said, and turned a piece of sod. He picked up a wiggly worm, replying, I learned a lot about God. Very fine way, the neighbor said, for a boy to spend his time. And if you tell me where God is, I'll give you a brand new dime. Quick as a flash, the answer came. Neither were his inflections faint. I can give you a dollar, mister, if you'll tell me where God ain't. <laughs> Emmanuel. God with us. And we are reminded that God uses the likes of us to reach out to a hurting, suffering world. Let me just call your attention once again to verse 6. May my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth if I, sell to, if I fail to remember you if I don't make Zion my greatest joy. What is the Christian's greatest joy? Is it not having Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior? Is it not knowing that even when things get difficult, God is with us? And the reality is God is present through the likes of you and me. Why? So that we might possibly be able to win others to the knowledge of Jesus Christ themselves. I, I read recently that the contemporary definition of a friend is something like a friend is someone who knows the song in your heart and can sing it back to you when you've forgotten the words. 
Might I be so bold as to suggest that a Christian friend is someone who knows the song in God's heart and is not only willing but whose heartfelt desire is to sing it to the world until the world can sing it for themselves. As we come together to the table on this first Sunday of October, it's a special Sunday for us. It's World Communion Sunday. I am aware of, of tradition differences, and I am aware of time differences. But in our hearts and minds, as we come to the table, we are reminded that all around the world, in places like this, in many places very different from this. In traditions like this, in traditions very different from this. People have, have come together to promote Christian unity and ecumenical cooperation. And so this morning... This morning, let the body and blood of Christ nourish us that we might indeed be the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. I would invite you all to turn in your bulletin and join with us in our communion liturgy.